everybody, welcome to our first online lecture in quotation marks for Chem 318. I'm just doing a screen recording. Uh, talking about the vibrational rotational spectrum for the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator model. Why are the gaps in the spectrum not exactly evenly spaced? Well, if you think about it, the bottom line is going to be you can't have a rigid rotor vibrate. As soon as it vibrates, the bond length changes, and that's going to be the bottom line here. This is kind of just an aside. Um, you don't need to know how to do this calculation, but I think it's interesting. So let's look at um, our rotational constant B, and we'll use subscript 0 for a B and that N equals 0, the ground vibrational state, and B1 for a B in the excited vibrational state. We've got our energy eigenvalue, the vibrational uh, quantum number, rotational quantum number, so we got the vibrational term and we've got the rotational term in the energy eigenvalue. So if we could make a table of states just plugging into this formula, here I've got the vibrationally relaxed three states uh, rotationally relaxed and then excited and excited and these are just the actual energies of the states so we're not going between states yet and then these are the energies of three excited states with relaxed rotationally and excited rotationally just plugging into this formula up here you get all of these all right now for a spectrum of course we're looking at transitions between states so let's look at absorption going from n equals 0 to n equals 1. The first two lines on the absorption spectrum for the P branch, so we're getting excited vibrationally but relaxing rotationally, are we could have E delta E sub NJ for J going from 1 down to 0, so E10 minus E01 and then you plug in these formulas from up here for the two relevant states and you get this delta E. So that's where you would expect your line. You can do the same thing for absorption. The next peak, um, relaxing, so in the P branch, J equals 2 going down to J equals 1. And you get this. So now then the gap would be the distance between those two lines in the P branch for the absorption. These are all going to be absorption vibrationally. The gap then is a difference in the delta E, so a delta delta E. So I'm just subtracting this one from, sorry, just subtracting this one from this one. And I'll take the absolute value because we're looking at just the magnitude of the gap between the two. And this is what you get. Now we could also look at the same exact thing but for the R branch. So we're getting excited rotationally. And it's going to be very similar um, except now where up here we have B zeros and B ones in certain positions. Now our B ones and B zeros are in different positions. And so when we look at our gap delta delta E, do that same subtraction and we get this quantity. So now if you look at the two quantities, the only difference is the 4HCB term was on the B1 for the R branch and on the B0 for the P branch. And it's on the B0, uh, the 2HCB is on the B0 for the R branch and it was on the B1 for the P branch. So now let's think about what B0, what B is and B we know is H divided by H pi squared C mu times 1 on R naught squared. But R naught is going to be longer for the vibrationally ex excited molecule than it is for the vibrationally relaxed molecule. Because obviously when you're excited vibrationally, you have, um, well, you have, you have more stretching and more compressing, but because of anharmonicities, the stretching is going to be longer than the compressing is shorter because um, remember our potential doesn't have the exact uh, harmonic well, it sort of heads up towards that asymptote 
for stretching out. So then B1 will be less than B0. So this will be smaller, this quantity that we're getting from here on the R branch will be smaller than this quantity on the P branch. So the gap in the R branch is smaller than the gap in the P branch for this example. And if you continued and looked at more gaps, you'd see similar results. All right, not a big deal, but that explains why the gaps in our spectrum aren't exactly evenly spaced because it's not exactly a rigid rotor. All right, more important for today. Measuring angular momentum with the rigid rotor wave functions and what this means for the uncertainty principle. So, here's our eigenfunction for the rigid rotor. And here's just the phi dependence. If we look at the angular momentum operator in the z direction, it depends on only phi because of the symmetry of our coordinate system. So we can go ahead and take the derivative of our whole eigenfunction. And we know that theta only depends on theta, so there's no derivative with respect to theta, so that slides through our derivative as a constant. But then we do take the derivative with respect to phi. You go ahead and take that derivative and you get a factor of i ml over square root 2 pi, the i ml because of the chain rule. So then our i's cancel, negatives cancel, and we get ml h bar, and then all of this. But what is all of this? That's just the eigenfunction back again. And so lo and behold, the z angular momentum operator um, is an eigenvalue eigenfunction equation. So the the eigenfunction is an eigenfunction of the z. We get it, we get it back again. So that's kind of cool. And we can say L hat z, where this is the operator, is equal to L z, where this is the eigenvalue. And so then L z is ML h bar where this is the value of the eigenvalue. So in other words, LZ is equal to ML h bar. Okay, on the other hand, if we tried that with X, the angular momentum around the X axis is now it breaks the symmetry and it's complicated. It's a function of both theta and phi. You don't need to memorize this or anything. But if we tried now to operate on the wave function, just take my word for it, we would not get the wave function back again. So the wave function is not an eigenfunction of the angular momentum around the x-axis, similar for the y. On the third hand, if we look at the total energy, so the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian for the rigid rotor, as it turns out, is L hat squared over 2i because the momentum is just like mv, the momentum squared is just like mv squared divided by 2m, where the moment of inertia is like a mass. And so this is like our kinetic energy, and all of our energy is kinetic in this case. All right, so this is just really an analogy, um, but for rotational motion. So anyway, L hat squared is equal to L x squared plus L, sorry, L hat x squared, L hat y squared, L hat z squared. And this is equal to 2i times the Hamiltonian. So L hat squared times the eigenfunction is just equal to 2i times the Hamiltonian operating on the eigenfunction. Oh, well, we already know that we'll get the E out, right, from the original Schrodinger equation, so this would just be 2IE. So L squared must be just h bar squared times j times j plus 1, which we know from when we solved the Schrodinger equation before. So that's kind of interesting. And just as a FYI, this is the form of L hat squared. 
Doesn't look like it would work out, but it does. Okay, so now we can say that L hat z and L hat squared have a mutual set of eigenfunctions. They are the eigenfunctions for the rigid rotor. Here's something new for us. When two operators have a mutual set of eigenfunctions, their eigenvalues can be obtained simultaneously. So this is different from what we saw with, say, position and momentum, where if we measured the position, then we couldn't figure out the momentum, and if we measured the momentum, we couldn't figure out the position. That was a Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We can find the angular momentum around the z-axis and the square of the total angular momentum simultaneously. And so the uncertainty, I could use sigmas here instead of deltas, the uncertainty is equal to zero. The uncertainty principle does not apply to these two variables. And here's in general a test. If two variables commute, and I'll define what that is in a second, then they will have a mutual set of eigenfunctions and not be subject to the uncertainty principle. So generally we have this thing called a commutator. And if we're just thinking of symbolically here, some operator a hat and b hat, uh, we say the we denote the commutator as square brackets around these two with a comma in between. And what this notation means is for some function f, the commutator of a and b of f is a hat b hat f minus b hat a hat f. And this will be equal to zero if a hat and b hat do commute. Okay, so you use the operators working from right to left. So B would operate on F first and then A would operate on the result. And here A would operate on F first and then B would operate on the result. Now if these are both eigen, uh, eigenfunction eigenvalue equations then it's no wonder that these are going to cancel because you just keep getting the function back again. So let's take a look. So here's math, math, math. Commutator of these two operators on F. Can write it out. Can do all this mathy math. And lo and behold, these two things end up being equal. And because they're equal, L hat Z and L hat squared commute, so they are not subject to the uncertainty principle. That's all I got for you in this video. Um, I'll be posting another one soon. Um, but the PDF of these notes are there for you to print out. Go ahead and use the chat or the forum. I haven't decided which one yet to shoot me some questions.